Okay, the Positive Gains is back. Our special guest today, Norman D. Golden II. Most of you guys would know him from uh, Cup and a Half. There are no children here, uh, among other things. Uh, Norman, thank you for joining us today. My pleasure. All right. Uh, so let's get started. Um, you know, on your background, uh, where are you from? Well, I was born in Wisconsin, for in Wisconsin, um, raised in Southern California, uh, South Bay area, Redondo Beach in particular. Um, yes, yeah, so I grew up in, in Cali. And uh, yeah, man, I mean, I've, I've traveled a few places, you know, been around, um, primarily here in, here in LA. So that's where I'm from. Probably from LA. Right on. Where did you, uh, how did you get the acting bug? You know, was that something that you wanted to do or was it kind of uh, introduced to you? A little bit of both. Uh, you know, it was introduced to me, you know, just via television. You know, I was watching, I used to watch uh, the Cosby show, you know, as a, as a, you know, with my family. It was a family show. So, you know, my, my parents would, turn it on after dinners, Thursday nights, you know, when it was actually on air. And, you know, I saw the the Cosby kids, you know, doing their thing. And, you know, I was old enough to know that it wasn't, like it was TV, obviously, and it wasn't like real life. Um, but it was a, like, I saw the make-believe and the, and the, the, the actions of what they were doing. And it just looked like, it looked like, and it seemed like it'd be a lot of fun to, to do that. Um, you know, side note, I used to always come up with these little skits and, you know, just like do improv with, you know, my uncles and, and some of my cousins. So I, I just naturally was drawn to, you know, all things theatrical pretty much. So that was my early inspiration, you know, watching the, the show and, and saying to my, my parents repeatedly, I want to do that. I want to do that. Like I'm going to, it went from, I want to do that. I want to do that. To, I'm going to do that one day. And, you know, my parents were, you know, and still are, they're, they're very, they, they love to inspire and support, you know, their, their children. So, you know, I never was like, oh yeah, well, you know, wait till you're older. It's like, yeah, well, you know, one day, <laughs> one day you'll do that. So uh, actually one day my mom was talking to my auntie and she had just enrolled her son in uh, this commercial, uh, acting commercial workshops. Now at the time we were actually living in North Carolina well, my dad's job had, you know, switched, moved us to, to uh, Charlotte. So the, <laughs> these acting workshops that my auntie was talking about was here in LA. So my mom was like, well, that sounds good, but how are we going to do this, you know, for six, what well, was eight weeks, actually two months. How are we going to do this eight week, you know, course? Yeah. You know, we, we're in North Carolina, that's, it's in LA, Burbank, so how's that gonna happen? So my, my auntie's like, well, you know, you guys, because my parents work for the airlines, she's like, you guys work for the airlines, so I mean, <laughs> like, you know, free passes, or they call them buddy passes, they still call them buddy yeah. passes think, now. And so my mom was like, oh, well, you know, like, thanks for just, like, looking all in our finances. And, and <laughs> <laughs> but, so she's like, well, I guess, you know, I can consider, because he has been, you know, talking about you know, every time we watch the Cosby show or anytime he sees a kid on TV, he's like, I want to do that. So my, my, my parents talked about it and they worked it out to where, you know, we, you know, we could make it happen. So my mom enrolled me in this, you know, this workshop that my auntie was telling her about. And um, lo and behold, we ended up traveling from Charlotte, North Carolina to LA uh, for two months. So what, I, what would happen is I would leave school on a, on a Wednesday, because they took place on a Wednesday. So I would leave school on a Wednesday. And you'll be, it's three hour difference, time difference. I could leave school, hop on a plane, get to LA. Then my mom had another friend of hers that would uh, pick us up, take us from the airport, take us to Burbank, wait for the class to finish. And then we would go back to the airport, catch a red eye, and go back to North Carolina, and then I'll go to school the next Wow. Time. So we did that for eight weeks. At the end of the session, there were three agents that were there and a bunch of managers. Actually, the lady who ran the, you know, ran the, the, uh, the workshop, she actually, in, she was interested in, in managing the, 
but it was kind of a conflict of interest because she had you know yeah. started the shop or whatever so she's like well i can introduce you and kind of help you guys you know guide you to the best representation that you know has come through here because then you know it was a bunch of other industry people too so there were three major agents there excuse me all three of them wanted to sign me but you know obviously my parents chose the best one for that right that particular period and um you know went from there just actually happened everything kind of happened in a, in, a, in a way where about three months after the workshop ended they selected an agent and they were still my mom was still trying to figure out okay well how are we going to make this work because we're you know three thousand miles away three months after all that happened uh, my dad got word that he was able to put in a transfer because he had seniority over all the people that were there and you know, at his job over there at um in charlotte uh -huh. so he put a transfer into LA and obviously once he put his transfer transfer in because of his seniority it was you know approved right away Number one. and we actually yeah so we moved back to LA about maybe five or six months after the workshop and then I started auditioning I got a few commercials um and then I booked some theatrical so I booked a tv show a guest appearance and then cop and a half came that's kind of where everything launched from there. Well, that's uh, that's got to be tough going back and forth. I mean, obviously it paid off for you, but you know, being young, catching a plane, yeah, you know, flying out and then doing a workshop, then flying back, and then I assume you know going to school yeah. the following day. Um, I'm yeah. sure that was you know. It Interesting side note, you know, I, when I would go to school, my, my teachers, you know, I would tell my teachers, you know, you know, oh, yeah, I was in, you know, I was in L.A. yesterday. And so because we were non-revenue passengers, we had to, you know, dress, dress up. So I had to wear a suit. So every Thursday for <laughs> two months, I was coming to school in a suit. And I'm like, yeah, I went to, I was in California, I was in L.A. yesterday. And so it got to a point where I think the fifth week or so uh i guess the teachers had enough of this kid to you know like bsing and make <laughs> lose so he calls my parents she, she calls my parents in she's like well you know norman I, we're concerned because norman is saying that he's going to la every week and you know we noticed that he's you know he's in a suit yeah. <laughs> thursday so is that something that's new for him are you guys trying to you know and, and so my mom and dad they kind of looked at each other and was like well actually he is going to LA every Wednesday. So they they told her what was going on and she's just like, wow. And he <laughs> was like actually able to come to school and he does his work and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So yeah, it was, it was, it was tough but as a kid. You're just like, hey, I'm, you know, and I was in, you know, doing what I wanted to do anyway. So, you know, it didn't really affect me that much. It didn't phase you. Uh, nah. So what came first? Was it, um, there are no children here? And then Cop and a Half? No, Cop and a Half was first. Oh, Cop and a Half was and first. Then, yeah. So. Cop and a Half was, the, was the, big, the breakout, I guess you could say, for my career. Yeah. So can you talk about working with uh, Burt Reynolds and that whole experience? I mean, that was such a, an iconic movie, um, especially for that summer, the summer in 93, or the year of 93, mm -hmm. excuse me. Um, yeah. I felt like that was a lot of movies for uh, the younger generation. I mean, you had Cop and a Half, yeah. uh, you had Free Willy, The Sandlot, um, mm -hmm. uh, Rookie of the Year. So that was yeah. a big year for movies. So, yeah, can you talk about Cop and a Half? Yeah, you know, it's interesting because, I mean, I, I hear you I hear you say that it was an iconic movie. And, you know, it's, that's, it's interesting for me because, you know, being a part of part of the film, you know, as an artist, like I do the work because, you know, I love it. I mean, most actors do, you know, we just, you know, we really look forward to sinking our teeth into, you know, whatever it is we, we do. So like to hear that is just kind of, I mean, I've, I've actually heard people say, man, you know, that's legendary and this isn't that, and, you know, and for me, when I think of, you know, something that's legendary, I'm like Denzel Washington, Malcolm X, or, you know, Sam Jackson in his entire career, just I'm all yeah. the, the myriad of roles that this guy has done. You know, but I guess, you know, like you said, looking back, I mean, it really was, especially the fact that, you know, me being, you know, an African-American mm -hmm. child, 
you know, with a role that big, you know what I mean? Like yeah. next to this iconic actor who dominated box office, you know, receipts for damn near a decade or more, you know, yeah. like Reynolds was like the seventies and eighties, like Tom Cruise or something, you know what I mean? Like he was the man of that era. And he's even, in, even in the early nineties, I mean, he still was very notable. So, you know, do, you know, having, just looking back on, you know, having the opportunity to be a part of a project like that, just, it, it, you know, I'm definitely grateful, grateful that, 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 that happened. Um, I mean, as a kid, just, you know, my experience in, in working on that, that, it was just a lot of fun. You know, I never, fortunately, I never got into, you know, like the Hollywood aspect of, of things. What I mean by that is, oh, you know, I'm working with Burt Reynolds. I mean, I didn't even know who Burt Reynolds was. I didn't know, <laughs> I had no idea that he, you know, I mean, I think it, it, it could have been a little bit different if it had been like Eddie Murphy or someone like that who you know I was or even Bill Cosby like you know I because these are people that you know I seen you know I, I saw and I knew okay that that person is famous well Burt Reynolds right. I had never really seen a lot of his work you know as a child naturally I would not have seen any of his work so I think that was a blessing in disguise because it really allowed me to be Devin Butler and not like oh wow that's like he's famous. Okay, I'm acting with a famous person, you know, so it, it just oh. everything that you see, you know, on the screen as it pertains to Cop and a Half is just organic. It's it's based on, you know, Burt Reynolds understanding because he had never really worked with, with you know, a lot of children in his yeah. career, but I was one of the first, but then he's like, wow, this kid is an old soul. He really doesn't know who I am, so I can kind of have some fun with this. It, it was less daunting than you know, he thought that it was going to be. Right. He, he made some comments about, you know, working with children. And, you know, he's just like, I won't repeat them, but he's just like, I, I would rather not do that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know um, but he, you know, after that shoot, you know, he, he, he even said, like, I have a lot of respect for, you know, your talent and you just, you know, as, a, as a kid, like, keep growing and keep doing what you're doing because you have, you definitely have a gift, you know? So hearing that from someone of his stature and, you know, the work that he's done was a huge compliment, you know? So, yeah, I mean, in a, in a nutshell, like working, you know, cop and a half, you know, working on that project really, even though I was so young, it really gave me a taste of what it means to, you know, really sink your teeth into something that you love. And, you know, having that opportunity at such a young age, once again, I, I've, I'm very blessed and very fortunate to have, have had that. I don't take it for granted whatsoever. Yeah. Were you, uh, you know, after, so during the movie, I imagine you had a, a tutor on set and, right? Yeah. And then so yeah, after, well, oh, go ahead. Well, it was, a three, it was a three month shoot. So it, we actually shot, in the summer months or leading up to the summer months so i was the last probably month or so of the actual school year i didn't you know i finished on set and so I, you know so it was, it was a three month shoot so about a month or so i had the tutor and then i was i was on summer break for the for the rest of the, the shoot were you able to go back to public school after um that year i didn't only because my career had started to kind of pick up um i ended up booking another film shortly after that which was there are no children here and i was shot in if my memory serves me correctly i could be wrong about this but i think it was shot in the spring of the following year 93 because it came out in um it came out in the fall of 93, actually Thanksgiving. It was on, a, it was a Thanksgiving special on ABC. So I could have that timeline mixed up, but I know I, the following year I did not return to uh, public school because I, I was, I was working. Working. Yeah. Um, 
So what was that like working with uh, Oprah? It was very interesting. It was different than my experience with Burt Reynolds only because, you know, there were other players in that particular film. It was obviously a different type of film. I mean, I went from, you know, comedy, jokes, lighthearted action stuff to, you know, this drama where we're talking yeah. about, you know, children here, you know, kids, you know, in the projects and, you know, some heavy stuff. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, the nature of the project was different and so was the set. You know, Oprah was a very gracious individual to me. I mean, I, I have nothing but, you know, once again, gratitude for her because actually that particular role I didn't even audition for. She actually hired me, you know. Um, my, so you know, the story, as the story goes for my mom, you know, she contacted my agents or her you know, representatives contacted my agents and was like, you know, we've seen his work. We know, you know, that this is the kid we want to go with. So, you know, hire him, pay him whatever, you know, whatever they're asking. You know, <laughs> don't, don't worry about negotiation and all of that. Just, you know, just bring him on. And what's interesting is, um, actually, no, I take that back. So it wasn't, it wasn't spring. It was actually summer. And I remember because I was on a, um, a celebrity kids cruise, I had done some work with, an organization that was promoting, uh, what was it, uh, research for, or we were doing fundraising for research for juvenile diabetes and, and cancer. Uh, so I was doing all these events and then it culminated into this celebrity kids cruise that I was on for a week before uh, principal photography started for their no children here. Okay. So Oprah was like, because the director was like, well, this he's not available, like he's gonna miss a week of rehearsal like, can we just go with someone else? And Oprah was like, no, we'll just wait <laughs> for him and he'll be okay. We'll trust that he'll be okay to kind of get back up to speed and, and all that. So they actually ended up doing like two table reads because when I got back from the cruise, we flew from Florida to Chicago and, you know, I went like straight to work. So uh, just, I kind of you know, digressed a bit, but working, yeah, working with Oprah was, you know, once again, I was very fortunate to have that opportunity. Uh, initially, once again, it was different because she wasn't, you know, I mean, this is Oprah went from any, and even though this was before this like pre-billionaire <laughs> Oprah, yeah. she still was Oprah, you know? I mean, at, at that time, her show was like at its peak, you know, she had changed the, she was getting ready to change her whole like production, um, the way that her, the show was set up and all these guests were coming on. And so, you know, she was, experiencing an upsurge in her popularity so there was a lot of like you know and she wasn't quite as accessible as like burt reynolds was or as he made himself to be mm -hmm. but you know not necessarily a bad thing it's just two different types of personalities and two different people but you know yeah. she was very great i mean i have nothing but good things to say about my working experience you know and even my personal experience with her you know and i'm grateful that I had that once again I had that opportunity. What about the uh the mental preparation, you know, going into reading for a role? I mean, uh excuse me. What is it uh you know, how do you get yourself ready for for a role? Um whether it be cop and a half or there are no children here? Because like you said, it's two different uh stories for those, you know, there was a comedy and then there was a pretty heavy drama. So especially as a child, psychologically, how do you, how do you tap into that? That's a great question. Um, <laughs> if I had an answer for you, I would like go into it right now. Like, well, see, you know, well, here's what you do. You take the Meisner and the, <laughs> the this and the that. <laughs> Brother, like, honestly, you know, for me, I have to say it was just, it was pure heart. Like I looked at whatever, I mean, I, I, I took this approach for whatever role that I, that I was preparing for, be it comedy or drama. I mean, I even, I even did a Western, I have a Western on my, um, on my resume and, you know, the, the adventure, which is Moby Dick, that was my last piece as a yeah. pound actor. Um, but I look at, I just, I approached each role 
obviously, you know, as a kid, it's like, okay, it's a blank canvas. I get a chance to play. So this is what this calls for. Oh, I have to be serious. I have to be somber. I have to be jovial. I have to laugh. Okay, then I'm just going to do that. So it's like, like doing what you're told, being able to follow direction and not think about it too much. You know, and I feel like, because I can see now, you know, after having most of the experiences that I've had and I look at, you know, artists now and, you know, you can tell those that they may be trained and they, you know, they're like, okay, well, I, you know, you can see it, you know, see the technique or you can, you, you can kind of understand what they're like, how they're, what they're doing with the, with the role, um, mm -hmm. as opposed to those who are just kind of just naturally, you know, doing, and even those people may have been trained, but they know how to just do what they do. So basically to, to get back to your question, I never really like, given that much thought, it was just, okay, I'm going to have fun with this. I'm going to be authentic. I'm going to be, you know, just go in and just do it. You know, and I think that was, for me, that was just the, the raw talent that, you know, casting directors and producers and directors or the people that I worked with, they saw and picked up on and, and appreciated. And it was like, hey, yeah, I want to hire this kid. Um, quick story about preparation. So I did this film called America's Dream, The Boy Who Painted Christ Black. And basically, this is a period piece. So, you know, it was based in, you know, 1948, Georgia, the South. So there was this scene, you know, for those of you who may not know what the movie's about, it's, a, you know, it's called The Boy Who Painted Christ Black. So it's a uh, John Henry Clark uh, short story. And it's about a boy who paints a black Christ in the segregated South or the, you know, 1948s, you know, you guys know what was going on yeah. <laughs> in, in that, that time, time frame. So in that era, so having a colored child paint a color Christ, you know, with the white superintendent that caused a lot of heat. So there was a scene where there were advocates, like my teacher was like, this kid is gifted, you know, we should, there was this pride day assembly that was happening where, you know, the kids could show off their, their art, their pieces of art or talent or whatever, you know, it's not basically like a, like a talent show uh, slash assembly. So, I, you know, my piece was obviously very like, whoa, you know, even for today, people might be like, okay, you know, wow, color Christ, okay, that's, very, uh, it's a hot button. So there was a scene where I it found out that I submitted this, this piece for Pride Day. And the principal was like, no, I'm not gonna submit this. And the only reason why he didn't wanna submit it for you know Pride Day was because he had this white superintendent that was promising him a promotion and he didn't wanna screw right, it up. Right, mess it up. Mess it up. But he also was, a, a black man and he was very proud of the work that his students were doing so that was like a conundrum for him like okay do I do this mess up my you know my promotion or don't I and get the promotion and then you know this kid is let down because this is exceptional work I mean the picture was it was a great work of art so long story short um, there was a scene in there where I had to confront the principal and ask like, you know, why isn't my painting being, I found out that my painting wasn't being you know, included in the pride day. Mm -hmm. So, you know, now mind you, this is 1948 Georgia. So if anybody who's black or ain't black and they know how things went down as it pertains to children and adults, right. children are to be seen and not heard adults, you don't confront mm -mm an adult about anything that just doesn't happen, you know, because there are consequences for that. So be that as it may, it was written in the script where I'm like, why don't you like my, you know, the kid, you know, he's getting like fresh with the principal. <laughs> and so I'm, I'm, you know, as I was 11 when I did it. So at the time I'm like, all right, I have grandparents, I have parents, you know, I, I know that this is, I was having a hard time really playing this actually on, on the plane, you know, going to, to film, you know, I was going over, you know, my, my, uh, my work and I was talking to my mom about it. And I'm like, I don't know how th this seems like 
I can't really get into this. And she was like, I know why you can't, because this wouldn't happen. Yeah. You know, <laughs> you would, you would be in trouble. Exactly. Not yeah. only the principal, but your parents and anybody in between, you know? So once again, long story short, what happened was when we were at the table read, um, I was talking with Bill Duke, who was the director mm -hmm. and Wesley Snipes was there as well. Um, and uh, one of the writers who, uh, Ron Stacker Thomas, he, he was the person who actually wrote the film version of it. And so I was like, I don't know if this is, you know, if this is like, you know, as a kid, I'm like, I don't know if I should be saying this or whatever, but I just don't feel like this is accurate for the period. Right. And so when I said that, did you know, they were adults. They kind of looked like, well, you're actually <laughs> right. <laughs> um, maybe we can try and rewrite it. So they were trying to figure out how they can, you know, replay it. And I was talking with uh, Mr. Duke and he's like, yeah, I mean, I, you know, thank you for pointing that out. You know, maybe we can try to rewrite it. But then I, I had a thought, I was like, wait a minute, maybe instead of trying to rewrite the story that is that the way it's written, I'll just work on delivering it differently. So as oh, opposed okay. to being sassy or, you know, co confrontational, like why you ain't, you know, take my painting and put it blah, blah, blah. I'll be sad. Oh, okay. Because as a kid, now I would be sad. And, you know, because this is TV, you know, suspension of disbelief, kind of, you know, getting away, taking some liberties, that will play a lot better than, you know, Aaron Crawford going to confront the principal about his painting not being, you know. So I say all that to say, you know, there's ways in which, you know, you learn to play around with the craft of acting and, yeah. you know, if you have a dilemma of what is written, like in that case, I had a dilemma of what was written. So as opposed to changing it, I'm like, I'm going to respect the writer, you know, because I'm now, I'm a writer as well. So I'm going to respect the writer and their vision. So it was, you know, we actually shot it. We did it, we shot it in one take. And, you know, it was incredible because there were people that, you know, on the set, you could hear the, the sniffles and people were like <laughs> really emotionally invested in, you know, what Wesley and I had, you know, worked with. Yeah. Which turned out to be much better than a rewrite, you know, in my opinion, because I was able to work with what I was given. You know, and that's 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 a main that's a main feature of being an actor that you know directors love to work with, and you know just having that range. Yeah. What uh that leads me to my next point. What have you been up to lately? You kind of hit on it already with writing, but uh. Yeah, I was going to actually. You know, I'm I'm a, I'm a writer. I've you know I'm a writer and producer, and I I, I do a little bit of directing as well mainly mostly writing and you know, focus on writing and producing. I did a short film that I actually released on Juneteenth called Misperception. It's about, you know, the black community, the relationship between, you know, the black community and law enforcement. Um, we all know that that's been, you know, a, a hot topic, uh, especially as of late, you know, during COVID and all that stuff the protesting and, and whatnot. Um, interestingly enough, this story came about because my cousin, my cousin, my first cousin, he's in Milwaukee, he's a detective. Oh, wow. Um, we were just kind of hanging out one time and he was telling us about, you know, the community and how they respond to black officers and the things that he has to go through, you know, being on the force. So uh, my cousin, which is his brother he's a filmmaker as well he's done some really um, great opportunity to um, direct a film but that's the, the project that's going to be coming up next year um, okay scale. can't talk too much about it but um, that's really good news so him and I kind of you know got together and he wrote this piece and was like I want you to you know to, to I want you to produce this with me and I want you to the lead role and you know that we did that that was it took us about a year or so you know just because of our schedules and things happening to get the actual you know piece shot and then 
this was about three, we shot about three years ago. And oh. once again, due to schedules and stuff like that, um, we were able to just now get it, or last, last uh, October, um, I ended up getting a distribution bill for it, as just, you know, from shopping it around. And um, we launched it uh, Juneteenth, like I said. Yeah, so that's one, that's one piece. And then I have another uh, web series, actually, that's coming out. And it's called Hollywood Kid. And it's based, you know, loosely on your truly and my experiences. Not as a former child actor, because obviously I'm not a kid anymore, but more right. so on what it looks like, you know, when you transition, you know, from, you know, being the cute or the, you know, the, the former child actor to, you know, an, an adult that still wants to pursue their career, but, you know, is having to now deal with the pitfalls of, you know, like driving your, I mean, just little things like driving yourself to your own audition. Like when I was a kid, I was like, hey, I'm being driven everywhere and I could just really just act. Whereas now I'm like, I've got to act and then do the business and then, you know, everyday life and all that stuff. And, you know, and then also dealing with the transition of, well, you're not a kid anymore. You've done work like then, what have you done lately? You know, trying to, you know, jump, get over that hurt. So yeah. uh, once again, this year, you know, in spite of COVID and all that stuff, I've been very blessed to basically have two projects. That one's already out, and then I, I just actually got. I'm working on my distribution deal for um, Hollywood Kid, and that's slated to be released February of 21. Wow! So you've been busy. <laughs> so lastly, what uh, what advice would you have for uh, anyone looking to follow a path similar to yours? authenticity you know i want to refrain from doing this usually you know when you get that question there's a formula that you follow you know, you know and it, it's it's you know the hollywood way you know you get your agent you get your representation and you get your headshots or you know that that's even with that even that i'm saying that now that's like yesteryear because now with the advent of you know youtube and you know low-key TikTok and all this other stuff, you know what I mean? People can create content and become their own, you know, mogul in the, in the making as well. Um, you know, I would say at the core of whatever you're doing, whether it's you're going to do it yourself or you're going to do it, the, you know, go the traditional route of trying to be discovered, um, you know, keep your authenticity about your, your craft and your art and know why you want to do it. I mean, there's a lot of pe people that are like, oh, yeah, you know, I, I just, I want to do it. Because, you know, the underlying thing is like, I want to be famous. I want to be seen. And, and that's the thing about human nature is like, you know, we, we want to be seen, we want to be heard, we want to be loved yeah. and acknowledged. So, you know, Hollywood offers an opportunity for all that stuff to happen, the basic human desire for all that stuff to happen on a very large scale. That's why yeah. you have a lot of people clamoring, coming to Hollywood trying to be discovered, trying to be seen because they, they need that, that gratification. Find that in yourself before you try and seek that through any industry, whether it's Hollywood or anything that you're doing, because that'll save you a lot of heartache. That'll save you a lot of, you know, you, know, you can't deal with the rejection that you get. You know, yeah. you can't deal with the, the, a lot of, there's a lot of, you know, like, there's a lot of politics and a lot of things that go on. And it's like, if you don't, once again, if you don't have a real solid why, then all that stuff will affect you. And I, I feel personally, it's really about the art. It's really about what can I do to inspire another person? Right. You know I mean, Tupac said, I may not be the person that will change the world, but I'll spark the brains. So basically what he was talking about, you know, was like being an inspiration and being an example for, a lot of other people, you know, to follow in his footsteps and do the same thing. Cause that's really what it's about. It's not about one person being the savior and, you know, the, that's it for this, whatever generation, you know what I mean? There's a yeah. lot of people that have a lot to say, you know what I mean? And the 
voices should be heard. So ultimately, in a nutshell, just to wrap up, is like, you know, be true to yourself, you know, be authentic with, with your art, you know, why you're, why you want to do what you want to do and, you know, know your craft, like know your, know what you are getting yourself into, you know, from a business standpoint and even creatively, because there's a lot of people side note, but it's, it's important. It's not really a side note, because it really is important. A lot of people get into it and they think, oh, well, you know, this person did it. I can do it. And, you know, they're going about trying to, trying to have this career in Hollywood. Yeah. With, with no, like understanding of what they're getting themselves into. And, you know, if I go out on a limb, I mean, I want to say lack of talent, but there's a lot of people that's like, study, work on it, get better. <laughs> Don't expect yeah. to just, oh, cause I have a look, you know, someone told me that I'm funny. So now I want to be a comedian. Right. You know, it, it's, it's like, it's a craft to this stuff, you know, and it's, it's work. It is work. It's not, all fun and games and then you know once you're you know there's an opportunity to blow up and you're doing your thing and then there's there's times when you no know, you know you may not be in demand or like in my case i mean i i had a, a career that was strong that was notable as a as a child and as an adult it's like people still know me you know i'm still a celebrity obviously i mean you know who i am people know who i am but yeah. you know how did that translate to work in right. the industry you know you're only as good as your last gig so those are the things that you know you have to have the stomach for and for me none of that ever mattered because i'm still doing my thing right so i don't need hollywood or you know gratification from someone else for me to still tell stories uh ladies and gentlemen norman d golden writer actor director and producer it's been a pleasure Thank you for being on today. Thank you shared you. a lot of great knowledge, man, and uh, can't wait to see what the future holds for you.